Good morning, everyone. We'll just give things another minute or so to let everybody join and then we'll get the webinar started. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our Weed Inspector Land Manager webinar. Um, we are so happy that you're here. Um, it's definitely a good day to do this. So um, for anyone who hasn't attended one of our webinars, my name is Katie McElhonyuk. I am the Plant Health Officer for... Sorry, I hope you heard that. Um, anyway, I am the Plant Health Officer for SARM Division 4. Uh, which is the Northeast, and I will be running today's webinar. So, um, sorry, my screen won't advance here. Okay. Okay, so there are six plant health officers. Um, I just wanted to give everybody an overview just in case there's a few new people here. Um, there are six of us across the, across the province. Um, we assist RMs and First Nation bands south of the Northern Administration Administrative District. Um, we deal with the Pest Control Act and the Weed Control Act. We help RMs and their appointed officials, um, just advising them on how to how to deal with this act, um, and we also assist with training those appointed officials. Um, in the summer, we also assist the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture with pest surveillance and monitoring to enable in emergency, sorry, <laughs> uh, early detection and rapid response to crop pests. Um, so yeah, that is that is in a nutshell what we do. Today's webinar will be presented by Clark Brenzel. He's the Provincial Weed Control Specialist with the Crops and Irrigation Branch of the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. If you've been in this industry for a little while, you'll have definitely seen Clark present before. He's really knowledgeable, um, so knowledgeable in fact, that he was recently awarded the Canadian Weed Science Society's Award for Excellence in Weed Extension. So congrats, Clark, and you can go ahead and start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Katie. Okay, uh, we're here today. Now I need to share my screen somehow. Let's see here, let's do that before we get going. Uh, where is that function? There we go. Um, there we go, that's the screen we wanna show. I presume everybody can see that. So Looks good we'll, here, okay. Okay, we'll start in. So essentially the, the thing that we're looking at reviewing is called the minister's order designating prohibited noxious and nuisance weeds. And essentially that just constitutes the weed list for um the the noxious weed act or the weed control sorry, the weed control act. I'm having a flashback moment, sorry. Um so essentially what has what should be happening on a regular basis is that we generally do things called regular regulatory reviews and oftentimes those take place every roughly about five years and it's been about 10 years since the the weed control act was passed and accordingly same with the the weed control regulations and the minister's order designating prohibited noxious and nuisance weeds. So uh, it's overdue. And so there's a couple other things that are kind of driving uh, this to happen uh, as well. We've got a couple of weeds that are kind of on our doorstep that we really want to kind of get into the list so that we can we can get on top of them as soon as they are detected within the province. 
and uh, be able to take action on those right away without having to sort of seek the uh, the voluntary compliance of the the landowner. So in this process, um, more of the formal process, what we'll propose to do that we're going to be looking at adding new weeds to the legislation. So moving some weeds around between the prohibited noxious and nuisance categories. And generally when we move these things around, we're only going to move them down in the category. So from prohibited to noxious or noxious to nuisance. It's very unlikely that we'd ever move anything back up because the idea is that those distinctions within that list really reflect the distribution of that weed throughout the province. And if it's widespread, it's not going to be in the prohibited category for sure. Uh, and we're unlikely to remove any weeds. So um, that's that's something that can probably make folks uh, breathe a little bit easier anyway. So we'll just do a quick review of the, the weed categories and what they really mean. Um, so with our prohibited category, these things are absent or rare in the province. And and the more that we have that are absent in the province, the better, because then we're that means we're ahead of the game and that we're on top of them before they uh, they get in, and we can actually implement uh, the early early detection and rapid response in its truest sense. And this plant, these plants have uh, already demonstrated uh, aggressiveness in other regions that neighbor us. So uh, places like Montana or North Dakota or Alberta or, or Manitoba. Um, and so as a result of that, it's likely that they're going to be aggressive in Saskatchewan as well. And so the enforcement goal with these is to monitor for the presence of them on an ongoing basis. And I know that there's a few municipalities that do that, but uh, it's not the more common uh, approach to weed management. Uh, municipally that's for sure and essentially once we find these things at the early stages of, of introduction into an area then the goal is eradication or scorched earth essentially so that we prevent that plant from growing that spot where it was found for as long as necessary to make sure that no additional plants grow uh, in the future. So this is what we have on our, our prohibited list right now. All the plants that are in yellow are not in the province yet that we're aware of. Um, any of the plants that are in white are found in the province. There is uh, that kind of grayish one there that's uh, puncture vine. That's actually been cultivated in the province, but it hasn't really been found growing in the wild in the province. So that's something that... Uh, um, is a, is a bit of a unique category. The uh, asterisks there are uh, plants that have been either ornamental or uh, medicinal species. Uh, things like curly leaf pond weed would be uh, from um, aquatic, either um, uh, fish ponds or aquariums in someone's house. So um, we can see that we've got a handful of these things that are in the province right now. And so, yes, those are really high priority uh, plants that we should be uh, getting on top of and making sure that we uh, can uh, pursue eradication of them. So when we find a prohibited weed, essentially it's hoped that the municipality will declare a prohibited area around where that the prohibited weed is found. And then uh, what that means is that that area may contain the area that has the weed infestation as well as a, a potential buffer, whatever is required around that to make sure that uh, there's there's kind of a uh, an area that's where the eradication zone is maintained where the weed wasn't so that if the, that plant happens to move uh, its seeds or other reproductive parts, um, distant from the initial population that we can manage that area as well. Um, those uh, prohibited orders or prohibited area of uh, bylaws can last for up to five years from the last occurrence of the weed at that site. And that that's a real key distinction in that if you are, have been monitoring and you get to year four of that and you find a plant, that means that that 
five-year time frame starts over again. And so you could be looking, if you've got plants that are coming up every three years um, and continuously over a 15-year period, you could be involved in monitoring that area for 15 years. Um, and I think pretty obviously they can authorize the spending of any money that's needed to eradicate the weed. Uh, they need to inform the director of crops and irrigation branch. So that's my boss's boss, essentially. Um, and largely that information would come to me so that I can help coordinate uh, some of the, the management activities and the eradication efforts. The weed inspector, their role in that process is to monitor that site from spring into fall for the occurrence of the weed and anytime they see anything come up, make sure that that uh, plant gets treated and killed off so that that uh, that plant doesn't continue to grow and produce reproductive uh, uh, parts. So whether that's seeds or roots or whatever, rhizomes, stolons, whatever. So that it, it essentially means that it can't reproduce and it can't uh, continue to persist in that area. Uh, hopefully the boundaries of that prohibited area are posted with firstly signs so that people know to stay out of that area. Um, if, uh, it's, if it's it's something that's feasible and it's, pro and it's not a huge infestation, you could erect a safe barrier around that, that infestation to make sure to prevent entry. And most of the time the thing that you're most worried about is the two-legged animals that want to go in and out of that area rather than the four-legged ones. Uh, most of the four-legged ones, there's really not a whole lot you can do about that, but um, um, it'll it'll be a bit of a deterrent um, to uh, going into that area. And if you're you're enacting an eradication zone in that area, then uh, the attractiveness of that area to any um, any herbivores that want to go into there would be pretty minimal. And you can uh, prohibit the seeding of any crops or entry of any person, machine, or domestic animal into that area. And the prohibition of seeding, I think, is a given because they're not. There's no point in seeding if they can't get in there to take the crop off. And that's the whole idea: is that no activity will really take place on that land until that weed is gone. Um, and uh, if there's no selective measures, the, the destruction of a crop may also be necessary. So that's a prohibited category. So with the noxious category, these ones are established in Saskatchewan somewhere in the province, uh, re typically regionally somewhere, uh, beyond the, the, the ability to practically eradicate these things. And so um, essentially, this is a horse that's escaped from the barn and it's gone running towards the horizon. So um, there's no real hope that we're going to turn the clock back and make sure that we're going to drive this thing back out of the province again. So the enforcement goal here is to sort of contain the populations that exist and make sure that if we have any isolated occurrences that occur in areas that that uh, have historically been without that that weed to date, that we can kind of take eradication efforts very similar to what we do with prohibited weeds and make sure that we get early detection and rapid response on those early infestations in those new areas and eradicate it from that area so that it, it doesn't uh, sort of get established and spread uh, any further. Um, and this is the list of uh, weeds that are on that noxious list now um, and we're looking at about 37 species on there um, and again the the ones that are asterisks are ones that would have had some kind of uh, domestic use so whether that be um, as a nutraceutical a health recipe uh, an ornamental plant um, uh, a feed plant of some kind, it could be any number of things. So example, uh, kochia is often looked at as a, a very salt tolerant feed in, in some locations. And so that, that could be how it got introduced. And in the case of an ox weed, and this is the one that you're, you as weed inspectors are gonna be dealing with more routinely, 
and it, this should be no stranger as to how you deal with these things. So if you've got an area that's less than five hectares, again, the goal is eradication in those cases. And so you, you, you may order the destruction of a crop if you don't have selective options. Uh, but you, in this case, you need the authorization of the Reeve or the district uh, councillor or division councillor in order to enact that destruction um, uh, process. If you've got greater than five hectares, uh, crop destruction isn't feasible anymore. The whole idea with crop destruction on that smaller area is that, again, you're going to be really intensive about that smaller area so it doesn't spread into the larger area of the land base. And so in that sense, you're doing the, the landowner a favor in that case, if you don't, again, if you don't have selective measures to control it. With greater than five hectares, you want to contain uh, that weed to that uh, infested site and then introduce other measures within that containment zone to kind of reduce the pressure overall. So that could be things like um, manual control measures, biocontrol, burning, et cetera, et cetera, any, and herbicides as well. But uh, you may not have to use uh, the big gun herbicides in those areas. Um, to manage those in those things if you've got all those integrated measures working together and then on the outside of that five uh five that um, containment zone you would have a no man's land around there where you've got an eradication zone to prevent that population from spreading out from that main area and uh and essentially watching for isolated things outside of that containment zone um and in the case of noxious weeds and we'll see also with nuisance weeds you can issue orders and agreements with the landowner uh, for an up to three year period and part of the rationale behind that is that in some cases if if it's a case of um there's some issue with the environment say it's saline or something like that what you can do as a measure potentially is seed that zone into uh, salt tolerant forage so that it provides cover and then the cover makes it so that that weeds like foxobardi and, and kochia can't grow in those areas and so that's why we have that span of three years in there and it allows that land to come into compliance rather than to have to be immediately within compliance within that first year now that three years time span doesn't mean that they've got three years to start work. That means that work needs to be ongoing through that three year time frame in order to make sure they're within compliance within the three years. And you also have the, the power to prohibit the movement of any material machine or domestic animal uh, if they have the potential of having those, those noxious weeds adhering to them. And that's just, Cole's notes of what the what the powers are for noxious weeds and then the other category is nuisance weeds so these are ones that are widely established across the province but they still are a problem jumping from one parcel to the next in very rapid fashion um, and there's only seven species in this this category this category can include native species and that's why we have foxtail barty in this category um, and not in a noxious category uh, and so in the case in this case the enforcement goal is to make sure we bring those nuisance weeds into more um, the same context as the land that's surrounding it and it, it may be a case of these weeds are just somebody's being negligent and they're not controlling the weeds or as i said in the case of a saline area it may just be that 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 uh, habitat tends to um, provide an advantage to that weed and so by changing that habitat you can uh, make sure that that weed doesn't have that that same level of, of competitive uh, benefit over other uh, growth and so on that list what we've got is uh, the seven species here um, the white species are native species and the yellow ones are uh, introduce species to the province and in the case of nuisance weeds uh, contrary to what we have with the other two categories where 
uh, you can go in there and if you're driving around, let's say you're driving around the municipality and you're kind of looking off to the side and you see this in a field, you can kind of jam on the brakes and start the enforcement process right away without getting a complaint. Whereas with nuisance weeds, you can only initiate a complaint when you have, or, or you can only initiate an enforcement process when you have a complaint, when the municipality's received a complaint from someone. And so um, what we end up with in that case is we're looking at introducing integrated management measures. And that, again, that's uh, biological, mechanical, uh, manual, uh, herbicide, um, fire, things like that to manipulate that area in order to try and uh, bring that, that uh, nuisance species back into balance with all the areas around it. And uh, so that's the, essentially the enforcement goal for that. And again, we talked about the three-year span, four orders and agreement. This is kind of a visual representation of what I just talked about, and it kind of gives an idea of, of where things fall on kind of the timeline, if you will. Um, so the yellow area is prior to the weed getting introduced to the province, and then that orangey area is just just recently after the plant gets introduced to the province. And you can see that that kind of span there, um, there's often a lag time when um, when you get a new weed coming into a new habitat that it takes a little while for it to adapt to its new um, habitat. And in that lag phase, it gives you a little bit of an opportunity to get on top of that weed and get it eradicated before it goes through its explosive growth phase. Uh, like we get with things like uh, leafy spurge. So things that kind of fit into those different categories are things like squirrel, snapweed, palmer amaranth are in that, that pre-introduction phase at this point. And then things that are in the post-introduction phase, but still in the prohibited category, things like spotted knapweed and field scabious. Uh, there's only a handful of populations of either of those through the province. Uh, that we're aware of and occasionally we find new ones and we have to kind of deal with them when we find them. That sort of darker reddish category is sort of the rapid growth period for uh, a, 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 an invasive plant and so essentially um, that's where we find our noxious weeds and then once you get into that blue zone you, the plants are pretty much everywhere so now you're into a bit of a coping phase. The interesting thing that uh, they did some work out of Australia and they looked at, well, what's the return on investment on activities that we take in each of these um, portions of that invasive timeline? And so if we deal with things prior to them being introduced to the province, so we take measures like having um, inspections at border crossings and things like that, that the return on those activities is is $100 for every $1 spent. And if we look at some of that early detection and rapid response stuff that we might be doing as a weed inspector with our prohibited weeds, you're looking at a $25 return for every dollar spent for the community, again. Um, if you wait until that plant is into that rapid growth phase, so with something like leafy spurge or scentless camel, you're looking at a, a uh, five to ten dollar return for every dollar spent and then if you get into that coping phase and and the plants is everywhere uh, really right now all you're getting is um, you're you're sort of addressing it for the season and and trying to get a return on the land base um, as a result of that continuous use of, of herbicides and things like that so you get a one to five dollar return for every dollar spent and so the whole rationale for early detection and rapid response is that we're getting a higher return for the activities that we undertake. Even though it doesn't seem like we are, we seem like we're spending a whole lot of time that's not really generating a return, but because we're not allowing that weed to get introduced in the first place, we're providing a benefit to the community, which is that, that higher value return to the community and allows the community to be more productive overall. Okay, so I'll just have a quick drink here before we get into the proposed changes. Okay, the first one 
that is a proposed new prohibited weed would be Himalayan balsam. And this is an annual plant that um, grows only from seed. It, it, um, if you knock it down and lay this plant down, it can root from the nodes and, and reestablish itself once it gets knocked down. Um, but as far as something that persists over the winter, uh, this thing dies back every winter and will regrow from seed. Uh, very similar to leafy spurge. Um, when you disturb this plant, when the seeds are ripe, it, it, the pods blow up and the seeds will disperse up to seven meters from the parent plant. So it spreads very rapidly from that perspective. Uh, this plant grows very, very rapidly. It can grow up to four centimeters or two inches a day and can it get up uh, heights up to three meters. Generally in Saskatchewan, we're probably looking at about two meters as kind of the typical height of this, this plant. Uh, but if you get some nice warm habitat somewhere, so you get a south facing uh, exposure and lots of water and things like that, it could get up to three meters here as well. Um, and it, it out competes and, and it generally it just spreads very rapidly and so it can dominate a landscape and make sure that uh, the native things and desirable plants get uh, get pushed to the side. And so we have a pretty significant infestation right now in the city of Prince Albert. And there's a, there's a drainage way that runs through the city from the, about the south central down to the river on the northeast side of the city. Um, and there's, there's plenty of this stuff growing in, in that uh, drainage way. And so it'd be important to get on that. I think it would probably be fairly straightforward to uh, be able to address that plant in some of those drainage ways unless those those they're containing water. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at with this plant. Uh, another new prohibited weed is either orange or meadow hawkweed. So orange hawkweed is very obvious. It's the one with the very orange flower there and the meadow hawkweed is the one with the yellow flower. Uh, these plants are, are low-lying perennial plants except for when the flower uh, uh, emerges and, and starts to uh, push up from that rosette and typically it grows as a rosette for the most of its life and then it produces that uh, aerial flowering stem um, while it's in its flowering phase. And uh, the entire plant, uh, both of them is covered in a fairly dense hair and you can see it in that top right picture there. Um, where you've got the hair over all parts of the plant and uh, the leaves are typically a spatula shaped. Uh, the aerial flower stalks bear three to four ray shaped flowers and so um, ray shaped flowers are kind of like things like uh, narrow leaved hawksbeard and things like that have ray shaped flowers where you've got a whole series of petals that go around in a circle around the plant essentially. Um, it does spread seeds by wind. It uh, produces seeds with a pappus on it so that they do uh, disperse by wind. Um, and it also reproduces by creeping lateral roots or stolons. And so a stolon is what a uh, strawberry reproduces by. So those, the strawberry runners are technically stolen. So this thing re reproduces by runners as well. Uh, it's very tolerant of shade, uh, so it likes to grow in, in urban environments or forested environments as well. Um, it does displace desirable vegetation, and there have been reports of orange hawkweed from Moose Jaw and Regina, and there's been a report of meadow hawkweed from up in the northeast part of the province. Another proposed new prohibited uh, weed is teasels as a larger group. And uh, these are uh, coarse tap rooted perennials. Uh, field scabious is kind of distantly related to these things. Um, they, you've probably seen uh, these things in dried ornamental arrangements. So the flowers in the bottom right there, or the flower stalks in the bottom right. You'll see those things in in uh, dried ornamental arrangements, and in some ways, that's how they kind of get around. Um, interesting fact about this plant is that it gets the name teasel because it was used initially to tease out wool from 
um, that was uh, sheared off of sheep. And so that was one of the first steps in, in the yarn making process. So that's what these things were used for initially. We've got mechanical means to deal with that now. Um, there's two different species here. So we've got the, the panel on the right and the panel on the left. Um, the one is the Fuller's Teasel, and that's the one that has the entire leaf that's kind of a, an oval shape and has kind of that geographic uh, leaf surface on it on the right hand side there. Um, and the other one is cut leaf teasel and that's the one on the left that has really deep lobes in the leaf. Um, where we're looking at these things being right now is in the, there's a bunch of these in Minnesota right now and it's the cut leaf teasel actually that seems to be advancing more rapidly towards us than the Fuller's Teasel. But when we're putting these things on the prohibited list, we might as well put both species on at the same time and not uh, mess around with either one. Um, and the other key feature is that they've got really coarse hairs over the whole uh, of the plant. And you can see that on the stems in the bottom right there. Uh, these are the ones that are um, kind of generating the activity with the, the weed list right now. And this the, the, the one in particular is water hemp, and that's the one in the top pictures. Um, they're both members of the pigweed family. Uh, the other plant is Palmer amaranth. Um, and amaranth are essentially just pigweeds. And so these are um, members of the pigweed family, but they're different than other pigweeds in that they have separate male and female plants and that's what that dioecious term is it just means that you've got separate male and female plants and so there there is subtle differences between uh the two in their appearance when they're in the flowering stage but in the the vegetative stage they both look more or less the same uh, another plant that has male and female plants is canada thistle so to use that one as an example. Um, they tend, both of these tend not to have any hairs on the entire plant, whereas the typical pigweeds that we have around right now uh, do have hair, whether it's very significant hair or whether it's sparse hairs on the plant. So what you get with these ones is a very shiny appearance typically. And so that's what you see on the water hemp on the top there. Water hemp is quite different from our normal pigweeds in the sense that it has quite elongated leaves as well compared to other pigweeds. Uh, Palmer amaranth, the way that you can uh, tell that from our other pigweeds is that the, the leaf stalk is longer than the blade of the leaf. So if you were to take, uh, let's see here, I'll get a pointer going here. Uh, okay. So, this is the leaf stalk that runs down here on that leaf. So if you take that and you fold it back, that stalk will stick out past the tip of this part of the leaf here. And that's kind of what I'm what I'm getting at when I talk about um, uh, the the petiole being longer than the. Oh, I lost my mouse now. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. Let's just do this. There, did it. Okay. Um, the other challenge with these two plants is that, that because they're outcrossing weeds, they're obligate outcrossers. So they're, if, if you were to walk into a room full of people, the odds of finding two people in there that were, that were identical in every way is pretty remote. And that's the same with these plants is that there's lots of diversity within the plant. And what that is is a recipe for resistance. So these plants have been found to get up to five or six way resistance including group twos glyphosate group fours group 14s um group fives group 15s so they're the that's a pretty significant amount of resistance in in some of the populations of these plants the ones that are close to us we're looking at at least group two and glyphosate resistance um and potentially um, group five resistance as well uh, in those plants, but they're very adept at adapting uh, to herbicides. So it's 
probably not unrealistic once they get established to see them develop resistance to group 14 here as well because it's uh, it's used quite frequently. And both of these compete aggressively with crops. They they like to get established in open road crops like row crops like soybeans and corn. Um, but we have found water hemp growing um, in canola and particularly in Manitoba, there is a canola field that had water hemp in it that was right on the Saskatchewan border uh, about equidistant between Mooseman and Yorkton. And so uh, the folks that are on the east side of the province, they want to keep their eyes open for uh, these plants. There's also a couple of counties in North Dakota that sit right underneath the boundary between us and Manitoba at the U.S. border uh, that have reported the species or the water hemp as well. Um, the, our, the county in North Dakota around Minot Ward County has reported uh, Palmer amaranth. And so we want to get on these species and make sure that we get them onto the, the weed list. Uh, this weed was actually on the Noxious Weed Act and I mistakenly took it off thinking that it wasn't really something that would be particularly relevant to us. Um, there's, there's two different species here which are both referred to echium species or bug loss species. Um, the uh, echium vulgare, which is viper's bug loss, is what's called a monocarpic perennial. And that's something that will grow as a, it'll grow as a rosette for a few years until it gets up enough, um, enough energy built up in the, the system. And then it'll flower once and then the whole plant will die. Uh, versus the the other one that's Patterson's Curse. It's a little bit different looking than the pictures that I have here. The one that I show here is uh, actually Viper's Bug Loss. Um, the Patterson's Curse is a little bit different looking than this one, but very similar features overall. They're both purple flowered. Um, and in some cases they have magenta centers. Uh, Bees really, really like these flowers. They draw bees from all over the place. But the problem is, is that they produce a toxin and the toxin in these plants damages the liver in, in the animal that's consuming the plant uh, without the animal even knowing it. So essentially one day the, the animal just drops dead from liver failure. Uh, the problem is that this toxin can be transferred in the nectar into honey as well. And so that's why it's important that we prevent this plant from getting any more established in the province than it already is. There's a few isolated populations in southeast Saskatchewan um, and it was introduced as an ornamental. Uh, another proposed noxious or uh, prohibited weed uh, are the knotweeds. Uh, they're the, uh, the giant knotweeds essentially. These are woody perennial shrubs or vines, and they grow very aggressively in particularly in moist environments, but they also have drought and salinity tolerance. And so what we may see, where we may see these things growing would be in slough areas, um, if they happen to get introduced to the province, or river sites or lake areas or something like that. Uh, they develop monoculture stands that shade everything underneath them. And, uh, they can cause pretty significant structural damage as well. And so you can see that there's a plant there germinating through asphalt. Um, that and essentially that plant is germinating from a runner from a plant that was off to the side of that asphalt. So it could have pretty, pretty substantial infrastructure effects. So hard on roads, hard on foundations, hard on um, all kinds of uh, man-made structures. And uh, this, these weeds have been reported in Calgary already. Uh, typically we find them in BC, quite uh, quite well spread in BC, but we're finding them now in Calgary as well. A uh, new proposed grass is vent Ventanata uh, or North Africa grass. And this is a winter annual weed similar to downy brome in the sense that it, it germinates in the fall and then it starts growing in the spring again from those overwinter rosettes. Um, it's not a very big plant, it grows up to about eight inch, eight in, 18 inches tall and that's very similar to downy brome. 
uh, the leaves are one to three millimeters wide. So they're just like a string. They're very, very narrow. They'd probably be very something very similar to uh, creeping red fescue leaves if you've ever uh, looked at those. And they can get up to about 12 centimeters long or about four or five inches long. They have a long blunt-ended membranous ligule uh, or um, essentially a leaf membrane um, and it's shredded uh, on along the length of it. Uh, leaves are hairless on the upper side but they have short stiff hairs on the bottom that makes it feel rough on the bottom of the leaf. Uh, these things invade rangeland, hay, roadsides. Uh, they have similar negative effects to downy brome and they can reduce desirable forage production by up to 50%. So it's reported in Montana and Southern Alberta right now. So we wanna make sure that this, particularly in the Southwest of the province that we're keeping an eye on this thing coming into, uh, into the province. Uh, Medusa head is another winter annual grass. Uh, it's very closely related to rye. Uh, it can reach two feet in height and it has these really crazy heads on it that uh, have awns that are sticking out to the side up to two inches long. Um, it has very narrow leaves again similar to Ventanata uh, with very small oracles and oracles are those little things that that clasp the um, clasp the stem at the the where the leaf meets the sheath um, at the the base of the leaf um, and those ons those crazy ons may have backward pointing hairs so that when you pull them it's it's hard to to pull on those ons and essentially that's an adaptive feature so that when those things shatter they can stick an animal fur and then they can get transported by animals uh, uh, across the landscape. Uh, this one here is a little more competitive, it can produ produce desirable forage by uh, 80% and it can also infest annual crops as well. Uh, this, this weed is also federally regulated under the Plant Health Act federally and so this is one of the only weeds that is, is actually uh, regulated uh, by the federal government. Uh, another new prohibited is plumus thistle. This is a relative of nodding thistle, the one with the great big uh, red flowers on them. Um, similar to nodding thistle, it's a biennial, so it, it grows as a rosette the first year and then it pr pushes up stems and flowers and dies the next year. Um, it has a tap root, doesn't spread by root pieces at all. Um, and it has uh, the spiny wings all along the stem and essentially those are just extensions of the leaves that run further down the stem. Um, the flower head resembles more like bull thistle where you've got like a, a vase shaped head with lots of spines sticking out from it and uh, some of those spines are recurved back down towards the ground or back towards the stem and uh, Again, it's similar competitive concern to nodding thistle. And I have a, have a suspicion that the biocontrol agent that infests nodding thistle will also infest this or also attack it. This is also found in Montana, just south of the Grasslands National Park. Uh, Dyer's Woad, again, this is another one that was on our noxious weed list initially um, that I took off because I didn't know any better at the time. Um, and so it's a member of the mustard family. Uh, it can be an annual, biennial, or short-lived perennial. And if anybody remembers that that phrase, it's the same as scentless cameo in that respect, is that you can have the plant germinate through any time of the year. And it, uh, depending on when it germinates, that determines when it flowers, whether it's in the current year or in the next year. And those plants that are germinating from overwintered plants are going to be much more vigorous than the plants that are germinating from uh, and flowering in the same year. Um, it has long, smooth margin blue leaves, so it doesn't have any lobes or any spines to it. Um, and it has very prominent white mid vein. These plants used to be used as a source of blue dye, uh, and that's how they got established in North America. 
Uh, just like other mustards, it's got four petaled yellow flowers, uh, has pear shaped seed pods, and those seed pods turn black at maturity, so that's very conspicuous. Um, uh, it's a native of Russia and Siberia, and it's found through most of Montana, where it's a uh, uh, 1A regulated weed there, and that's the equivalent to our prohibited class. The another new prohibited series of prohibiteds are other nap weeds, such as the ones that we have on our our list now. So we'd be looking now at big head, brown ray, and greater nap weeds, and very similar that you've got that that sort of vase shaped bud with uh, um, flowers that spread out past the, the the head of the, or the base of the bud. Um, big head is a yellow flower, and the other two are magenta or pink or purple, like um, uh, um, spotted knapweed. Uh, right now we can find uh, big head knapweed in the Calgary Edmonton area. Uh, brown ray knapweed is in northern Idaho and northern Minnesota, so on either side of us and could kind of move in to catch us in the middle. Uh, greater knapweed is right now in Great Falls, Montana. Uh, so it's not very far away, so it's probably uh, prudent to get these things on our list. Uh, now to move to a proposed noxious uh, weeds that aren't on our noxious weed list yet. Uh, common malleen is uh, it's it's a plant that's kind of been around for a little while, but because our um, climate could be shifting a little bit, it may be making <clears throat> making this plant more adaptive to our area. It typically likes um, wetter cycles in the province, and so generally, what we find in some of our uh, our weed identification records is that this thing shows up one, two years after uh, our wet cycles um, <clears throat> historically. And it has traditionally retracted during dry cycles, but in some some cases we're seeing more of these things persist longer into our dry cycles as well. Uh, it can be problematic in sparsely vegetated areas, so at the edges of roads and uh, interrupt the uh, uh, vision at roadsides and things like that. Uh, gravel pits can be problematically, and it's found sporadically through uh, Saskatchewan. I know there's a population on the rail bed at uh, Indian Head there. And very similar to the burdocks that we have on our list right now, uh, this one's woolly burdock, and, and similar issues and similar life cycle to our current burdocks, it has a tap-rooted, uh, it's tap-rooted biennial, so it germinates the first year, grows as a rosette, and then uh, bolts the second year and produces flowers and then dies. It spreads in animal fur just like the other burdocks. Um, it's a competitive issue, it causes animal irritation. And the real thing that distinguishes this from the other burdocks is that in those burrs that you see growing on this plant on the right-hand side, you can see that there's there's woolly hairs that that grow in through the the spines on that uh, on that bud, and so that gives it the term uh, woolly burdock. I know that we've I found this in Regina, and I've also seen it in uh, Melfort as well. Another proposed uh, new noxious weed is creeping yellowcress. Um, it's a, a perennial member of the mustard family and it's a creeping rooted perennial. So essentially it, it uh, reproduces by rhizomes and by seed. Uh, it doesn't get very big, it only grows up to about a foot tall. Uh, and it has very, very deeply lobed or even what we would refer to as parted because um, there's lots of space between the leaflets uh, on there. And uh, it's uh, often introduced through potted perennials. So if you get uh, get a fruit tree or something, you'll find it comes in the pot uh, in those potted ornamentals. And uh, we have had reports of this up in the northeast part of the province in Saskatchewan. Uh, we've got the proposed new nuisance yellow salsify. And so currently we have um, 
um, meadow goat's beard or uh, tragopogon pretensis on our nuisance list and that was an error made by me again when I put uh, meadow goat's beard on the nuisance category because we really don't have a whole lot of meadow goat's beard uh, maybe a few plants in the southwest part of the province there's lots of it in Montana um, but the biennial that is yellow salsify or tea dubious that has the long bracts that stick out past the flowers uh, that is widespread across Saskatchewan and so that one belongs in the nuisance category and what we would do is propose to move the uh, metal goat's beard from nuisance up to noxious so that we can make sure that we get on top of it and make sure that we minimize spread. Clark, just so you know, we've got about 10 minutes left. Sure. Yeah, I think we're we're getting pretty close, I think. Yep, we're on 25 and 28, so we're pretty good. Um, so anyway, these are biennial. Again, they grow as a rosette the first year. Um, the rosettes actually look like grass, so they're kind of deceptive that way. Um, and then they produce flowers the next year and die. And again, they have those typical yellow ray, shut, ray type flowers of the sunflower family. Um, but again, the distinction between the two is that you'll see those really long, again, I'll get my, my pointer out here, wherever it is. Um, you get these really long bracts here uh, showing up on the yellow salsify. Whereas on the meadow goat's beard, the bracts don't get any longer than the petals. And so they don't stick out past, uh, past the flower's edge. And then we also have a few plants that we uh, be looking at changing the categories. And the first one is hound's tongue, moving it from prohibited to noxious. And there's significant an amounts of this in the Southeast part of the province. And so, probably widely enough spread that we're never going to get rid of it and we also have a very effective biocontrol agent now that we just introduced that hopefully will bring the the populations of this plant down very significantly and and we wouldn't be able to really use that that agent uh, a biocontrol agent in the prohibited category because the eradication is the goal but i think we have too much of this to really um pursue eradication anymore. Um, the other um, things that we'd be looking at is demoting Canada thistle, kochia, nodding thistle, south thistles and prickly lettuce to the nuisance category. Again there's enough of these things around the province that they're fairly widespread and they're pretty commonplace so uh, there's not much preventing spread anymore. It's more about uh, dealing with the plants that are current on the landscape and and dealing with them as they occur um we did get some feedback that uh that there was an rm that wanted to do some proactive work on kochia um to try and deal with some saline areas and so that might be something that we reconsider but one of my concerns with kochia is that when I introduced it to the Nox or left it on the noxious weed list in 2010, my hope was that there'd be more proactive monitoring for um, populations of this, particularly in fallow, where you saw lines going across fields, and then act on those immediately, make sure that those lines get worked under, and then minimize the development of glyphosate resistance. But we're now at a point where glyphosate resistance can be found in about 80% of kosher populations. And so uh, that means that we've been relatively ineffective in that uh, type of activity. Um, but we also still have uh, group fours and group 14s to uh, lay waste to with respect to kosher. So, uh, hopefully we can get on top of those and that if you see lines through fields where those are being made then you can get on top of it and deal with those uh, again. But if that that resistance in that plant continues to progress it'll get demoted, uh, it might get demoted right off the, the weed list altogether because it, it would be totally commonplace at that point. 
And there could be other additional suggestions. If anybody has other ideas about things to demote down to the nuisance category, uh, that we'd be open to them as well. So that's what I had to present. And so that's my contact information there if you uh, want to get a hold of me at any time. Uh, and if there's any questions, I can entertain them. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. The one question that I had, Clark, um, just wondering about Himalayan balsam, what length of time are the seeds viable for? Um, that I don't know. I would have to look that one up. Okay. Don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. I'll be um I'll be bugging you for it later then. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oops. Okay. So if there are any more questions, we do have a few minutes left. I'll give you guys some time. Um okay, we do have one. Hang on one sec. Okay, if a hayfield is known to be infested with absinthe wormwood, is there a way to restrict the movement or selling of those hay bales to limit spread? Yes, you can issue an order uh, that would prevent that person from moving those hay bales off that field. Um, they're more than welcome to feed those bales on that field, but your, your order would prevent them from moving off that field. And if you can get authority from your reeve or your division counselor you can have those bales burn perfect that is a great answer um our next question is on biocontrol for hound's tongue mm -hmm. they were just asking what is it and how does it work um well you've had lots to do with that Katie. you want to answer that <laughs> Uh, not, not as much as Joanne, actually. I was on mat leave at the time, but that was oh, released. Okay. But yeah, we okay. released, uh, released that agent down by, um, of course, I'm drawing a blank now, near Mooseman. Yeah, I believe it's a crown feeding weevil. Uh, so it's one of those bugs with the long snout on it. Yeah. And uh, really likes, um, really likes hound's tongue. And so it can bring hound's tongue down to near eradication levels. They have had populations um, of hound's tongue in BC, however, that have developed resistance to that biocontrol agent. So that's kind of an interesting development that the weed has evolved past the, the, the predator, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Um, next question is, has there been any change to the organic policy? What organic policy? I, I, yeah, I, I would think that he's just asking about the Weed Control Act itself and if there's any changes regarding organic farmers in the act. Organic farmers are bound by the legislation as much as conventional farmers are. There are no specific weed control measures indicated within the legislation. And so that means that that all landowners, regardless of their uh, philosophies, are obligated to control their weeds that are that are on the regulated list. Perfect. Uh, is anyone monitoring greenhouses for selling noxious or prohibited weeds? I know that's a good question to put back to the weed inspectors. Are you monitoring <laughs> greenhouses for the presence of noxious weeds? That is definitely that's, something to keep an eye on. That's your drop. Yeah. That's your drop. Yeah. Yeah. So having a good relationship with your local greenhouse is definitely a good idea. And just, just yep. looking out for things as you're walking through would be a really good thing. Yep. Every once in a while, what we'll do is we'll we'll um, send a note out to the the greenhouse growers association, just to make sure that their members are aware that um, what's like when we do these updates. That'll be that'll be a group that we consult with and and send this list of species to to make sure that they're not uh, they're not selling those species. Uh, Surely the word is out by now that nobody should be selling uh, purple loosestrife anymore and um, 
you have to be careful about whether somebody is selling uh, scentless chamomile or whether they're sending, selling herbal chamomile. And there are differences, and there's way that you, ways that you can tell the difference between those plants, um, largely because the herbal ones smell really nice, uh, and scentless chamomile doesn't. So, um, but when they're flowering, typically the herbal chamomile types will have a very conical button in the middle, and the scentless chamomile will have a very rounded button. Good to know. Uh, the next question is, will a separate category be added for herbicide tolerant weeds and how to manage? No. No. Okay. Okay. Um, what if again, you see... the, again, the legislation does not have management practices in it. Right. So indicating herbicide resistant weeds would kind of fall outside of the bounds of the legislation. Okay, so just going back to the, the greenhouse question, there's kind of a follow-up here. It says, will a separate category, or sorry, <laughs> um, what if you see baby's breath in something, a store like PV Mart, you see seeds there? Um, what, what, you ha what you'd have to do is make sure that it's the correct species because we have to realize that there's multiple species of baby's breath and it's only the gyp Gypsophilium pinaculatum that is the problem species. There are several ornamental uh, types that are annuals or double flowered types that are not problematic. And so they're, they're not the ones that we're really after. So as long as they're selling Gypsophilium pinaculatum, then you can go in and, and essentially lock them up and tell them they can't sell it. Order them not to stop selling it and order the seeds destroyed actually. Okay. Okay, the next one is, are the invasive invasive plant species guidebooks going to be printed and available again? So I'm, I'm thinking that's those small ones from the SAS Forage Council. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's something that, that the SAS Forage Council, it's, it's kind of a joint effort between the Saskatchewan Invasive Species Council and the Saskatchewan Forage Council have um, have control of. That's not a provincial government publication, so that's not something I really have control over. Um, and I presume they're they're fairly popular, so I presume that they will be printed at some point again. Okay, so they would be the ones to contact in that case. Yeah. For now. Okay. Uh, we do have a question from Alexander, and it's just asking about where to learn more about all of these things. I'm not going to read the whole question because it is quite long, but um, but just so you know, Alexander and, and everybody else out there, um, if you need any more information on anything that was covered today, you can definitely contact your local plant health officer. And I'm going to be displaying a screen with all of our contact info and where our territories all are. So. Definitely follow up with one of us afterwards and we can help you get the info you need. Um, our last question for today is um, just to remind provincial specialists that organic agriculture is not a philosophy but a very viable model of production. So just a, just a, sure. a, a tip for everyone to remember. So As long as you control your weeds. That's right. Okay, um, just one more thing to mention before I let everybody go. We are holding an in-person training session for appointed officials, uh, that's weed inspectors and pest control officers, as well as First Nations land, land managers. Um, it's in person, it's focusing on navigating conflict. There are four separate dates, two in Regina and two in Saskatoon. Um, if this is something you're interested in, definitely contact me at the number below, right on the bottom of the screen, and I can get you registered. The deadline for the Regina workshops is tomorrow, so if you are interested in Regina, let me know as soon as you can and we can get you in for that workshop. So I'll leave that up for a second or two here just so you can copy the info down. One more thing to mention is that 
there will be one more webinar coming up and that one is mostly for pest control officers but if anyone else is interested you can sign up for that as well it is on Richardson's ground squirrel control which is on February 13th and you can contact your division's PHO to register for that one so this is our map this is who we are so feel free to contact us if we can help you with anything at all so um, with that I think we're definitely past our time so thank you so much for attending everyone we really appreciate it and uh, have a great day thanks Clark